This is the Churnet Valley in Staffordshire, and we're here on unfinished business. A few weeks ago on the Time Team Big Dig, the people who own Furnace Cottage down there put a test pit in their front garden. They were looking for the structure that gave the cottage its name, an Elizabethan blast furnace built in the same year that Shakespeare wrote Richard III. They didn't find the furnace, but they did find this. It looks like bloomery slag, evidence of a much earlier form of iron making. And it was found among a scatter of medieval pottery. So it looks like someone was making iron down there hundreds of years before the blast furnace was built. This test pit, dug by the owners in just one day, took the story of Furnace Cottage back 700 years and opened up the possibility of a huge and revolutionary industry in this valley. Now we're back with the whole team and three days. I think we can build on that, don't you? Weeks after the big dig descended on this quiet corner of Staffordshire to search for one furnace, Time Team returns to Furnace Cottage to hunt for two. One Elizabethan, one medieval. That's a lot to hide under one small lawn. I'm not quite sure why we're geophysing the garden now. I'd have thought it's just a small area, isn't it, really? Just take up the whole thing. John? Hi. Why are you bothering to do here? Well, it is really small, but, I mean, we've got some positive results. Oh, that's nice. I mean... That's where the test pit is, here. And look at this anomaly. Really big response from this sort of area. And then what looks to be a sort of channel feeding off down to the stream. What and does that, that imply to you, David? Well, that looks to me like that could well be the corner of the furnace. And yes, this channel down to the stream, perhaps the water channel, there would normally be a drain out from underneath the half of the furnace. Yeah. Because if you get steam underneath a furnace, you do get a big explosion. And they didn't want that. <laughs> Um, I mean, I hesitate saying it's the corner of the furnace yet. I mean, yeah. it could just be the spread of the slag, couldn't it? It could be. Um, is that actually the edge of the lawn we're looking at there? Or, or yes. have you gone... Oh, it is. So we've got this lovely lawn, but actually the implication would be that we would... Take up the Well, enemies. I would go into the flower beds and right across the lawn. I feel we've, we've done the sort of one little keyhole investigation here. We need to get something bigger that joins up. If we come right across here, we'll, we'll see what's going on outside this building, if it is a building, as well as what's going on inside it. So Trench One will investigate the area where the big dig test pit revealed a layer of blast furnace slag. Our first target is part of the Elizabethan furnace complex, possibly the corner of the furnace stack itself. We'll be keeping our eyes open for evidence of a medieval furnace too. Although if there was one here, it's likely to be buried much deeper. The chances of uncovering any of it today are pretty slim. Oh. While the diggers get busy, I've tracked down the owner of Furnace Cottage, Rob Chapman, to find out why he invited us back. In the best of all possible worlds, what would you like us to find? Well, I'd like us to find evidence of something like this having existed um, in the garden. It's great having an illustrator in the garden, isn't it? It's amazing. The furnace may possibly just have been at the other end of the lawn where the test pit was, and we're sitting sort of about here. Yeah. And this little stream is still there at the bottom of the garden. We've a pretty good idea of the sort of thing we're likely to find in Rob's garden. Most Elizabethan furnaces were built to the same design. At the centre of operations stood the furnace stack itself. The raw materials, charcoal and iron, went in at the top. A huge pair of bellows, powered by a water wheel, raised the temperature to the level necessary to smelt iron, which was then run out into sand moulds in the casting house. But the furnace stack would have been the centrepiece of a much larger industrial complex stretching out into the woods and valleys around Furnace Cottage. Stuart wants to piece together this bigger picture and he's plotting his campaign with the help of county archaeologist Bill Klemperer. And you can see as well that the area all along the Churnit Valley, even nowadays, is very heavily wooded with all, this, all these green patches on the 25,000 mm -hmm. map. Of course, you, you need lots and lots of timber to support the charcoal smelting itself, don't you? That's right. So a whole industry in itself 
um, creating the charcoal, managing the woodland so it's not exhausted too quickly, mm -hmm. so, and that all being brought to the furnace site in horses and carts. Right. In the field across the stream from Rob's garden, geophys are extending their survey. It's possible that parts of the furnace complex, and maybe even the furnace stack itself, could have been sited here. Meanwhile, in the incident room, Carenza's finding out more about the origins of the furnace, the brainchild of Elizabethan entrepreneur Francis Willoughby and one of the most powerful women in Elizabethan England, local landowner Bess of Hardwick. This sheet here is actually the, um, the business plan. It's only on one page, but this effectively spells out the plan that was produced in order to raise the capital for the ironworks at Oakamore. That's amazing, isn't it? You see, he's listed the furnace yes. and the forge and every single little sort of thing. A ton of sows of iron stands in all manner of charges and then the figures for every single item. That isn't it amazing it. to have that sort of detail? It's, it's, it's wonderful. Fantastic. For, this, for this age to survive these account books so completely is absolutely wonderful. We're still shifting the spoil from trench one. There's no room for a mechanical digger, so everything's being dug by hand. It looks like it's going to be a long day for Phil. There will be more. But the trench hasn't taken out quite as much of the lawn as I'd expected. Hey, this is only half as long as it's supposed to be. No, actually, it's uh, less than half as long. It's only four metres long. But we democratically agreed that we would dig a trench all the way right to the end of the grass. Democratically, was it? Well, I unanimously voted that it was going to be only four metres long. That's the behaviour of a tyrant, Phil. Why have you done that? Because I want to save myself a lot of work, too. If you look over there, look how much topsoil we've generated from a little tiny hole. Think how much you were going to get from ten metres and how much further we've got to go down. Well, you can tell Carenza. All right, send her over. Listen, as well as that, are you going to put in a test pit there and another little trench over there? Or have you decided that all you're going to do is this? Would you prefer me to put in two extra test pits? Yes. But of course, then Because I that's should... what we agreed on. Then I should do it. We know the Elizabethan furnace would have used bellows driven by a water wheel. It was water power which delivered the blast of air necessary to get the furnace hot enough to produce cast iron. It's possible the medieval iron makers would also have harnessed the power of the stream here. While Stuart searches for evidence of water management, Geoffiz have completed their survey of the field on the other side of the stream. We asked Geophys to do a bit of work in this field because the topography is so interesting. You've got what appears to be an ancient trackway coming down here, sort of peters out around here, and you've got this platform here, and over there in front of our cottage, you've got this other platform here. John, is the Geophys as interesting as the landscape? It's far better, far better. Look at these cool. absolutely fantastic responses again, and they run right at the edge of the stream. And well, I'm wondering if they're more slag deposits. Um... I'm not so sure about slag. I mean, one of, one of the things that's kicking around in the molehills down there are little bits of roasted ore. So one possibility is that it's perhaps where they're preparing the ore. What about the, the actual landscape? It does look as though it's platformed off here, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, but yeah. come and look. Because the anomalies basically start here on yeah. this level area and they come right down to the edge of the stream. Where, where we've just discovered Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, mate. Hi. <laughs> what are you doing here? Well, there are two ways to practice archaeology, Tony. One is to sort of blindly rely on science, or the other is to use your, your common sense. And here, there's this platform, and the stream has cut through it, so it's basically given us a, a ready-made excavation section through it. John called it an earthwork. Do you think it's an earthwork? It, oh, it's definitely an earthwork, and it's artificial. It's got regular sides, got a regular plan shape. And then when you look through the section here where the rabbits have been scraping, you can see it's made up of a slag and this clay, possibly a bit of a furnace lining there, and it's all down this section here, ready-made uh, section. This platform could be the site of a storeroom for the furnace, or maybe the furnace stack itself. Trench 2 will investigate further. We've also opened a third trench in the garden here. Meanwhile, Phil's uncovered our first real archaeology. Now we're on to this much 
blacker stuff. It's harder too. Can you hear it? I mean, I it, it's really compacted, and uh, and it's got these big lumps of of slag in it. Yep. Oh, that's nice. That's that's absolutely classic glass fir. This slag. It's green. It's glassy, and it's light light in weight. There's no iron in this. They've got a good clean separation between the metal and the slag. And the sand interests me too. Because that, that sand could, could be the sand of the actual casting bed that they ran the molten iron out into. Have a look at that. Ooh, yes. Feel, feel the weight of that. Well, it, wasn't that so much, iron. <laughs> it wasn't so much the, the, the weight of it that attracted me. It, it's rusty. That's right. It's rusty and it's he heavy as hell for its size. That is a piece of iron. That's a piece of iron, yeah. So here we've got both parts of the process. We've got the slag waste yep. and we've got the end got product, the iron. The iron. It looks to me like we're sm smacking the casting house of the furnace. Well, I think we'd better go down and see what this layer gives us. This looks promising. If Phil can prove that his trench contains part of the casting area, it means we're close to the heart of the Elizabethan furnace complex. But we also hope to find evidence of medieval iron working. The test pit we put in during the big dig turned up a single tantalising fragment of what's called bloomery slag. It suggested people might have been making iron here for centuries before the blast furnace. This is 13th, 14th century, round about the time of the Black Death. Mm -hmm. We have no idea there was a bloomery here at that date. Yeah. Our medieval iron workers would have used one of these, a bloomery furnace, a clay chimney about two metres high. The raw materials, charcoal and iron ore, went in at the top. Bellows were used to raise the temperature inside. And after a few hours, a lump of iron and slag called a bloom would form. This was removed and refined to produce workable iron. Bloomery bellows were usually hand-operated, but occasionally they were driven by water power, which made it possible to keep the furnace hotter for longer and produce better iron. The stream near Furnace Cottage raises the possibility that a bloomery in Rob's garden could have been water-powered. Only a handful of these have ever been discovered in this country, so to find one here would be a fantastic result. But although we've dug much deeper and wider than the Big Dig test pit, we've found no further evidence of medieval iron working. That solitary piece of bloomery slag is starting to look a bit lonely. It's the only piece that's turned up. So in my view, I think it's a red herring. I think that, that, that it's probably just a piece of slag bought in for some other reason. Remember, it was in that top 60 centimetres that Phil mm. said was really garden. It could have been bought in just to decorate a piece of rockery. Or perhaps just as hardcore or something. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Oh, right, OK. So I think really that's the end of that bit of the story. <laughs> this is a bit of a blow. We hoped the garden at Furnace Cottage would contain evidence of centuries of iron making in the valley. But so far, we found nothing which predates the Elizabethan furnace. If we want to take the story back to the medieval period, we'll have to cast our net a bit wider. There's no doubt that people were making iron in this part of Staffordshire during the Middle Ages. The countryside's rich in the two main ingredients of the process. These woodlands provided the timber necessary to make charcoal, and they were also a rich source of iron ore. This may look like a muddy pond. In fact, it's the remains of an open cast mine, supplying material for the furnaces in the valley. I think the whole area would have been buzzing with activity. You know, all these valleys, they would have been full of woodland, but there'd been people working in them, either producing the charcoal or mining the, the materials they needed or transporting stuff backwards and forwards in by pack animal and various forges and, and mills and stuff in the bottom. So totally different picture, very industrialised, probably very noisy and very smoky. Not the view you've got today at all. So this wasn't the only furnace around here? Oh no, there'd be lots of other sites. The, the critical ingredients for the iron industry, the, the, the woodland, the, the, the ironstone itself and the water power exist in the, along the Chernit Valley and its tributaries over quite a large area. So there's a number of documented sites which we know about, there's other documented sites which we don't know about and there's other other sites in the woods here waiting to be discovered. Mick's taken a look at some of the other medieval sites recorded in the valley. He likes the sound of this one at East Wall because it's mentioned in some 12th century manuscripts from the nearby abbey at Croxton. Stuart's gone to investigate the earthworks, although I have to say he doesn't exactly look overwhelmed. But at least we've still got plenty to keep us busy at Furnace Cottage. In the field across the stream, we're still investigating Stuart's platform trench. And just as we'd given up hope of finding anything medieval in the garden, 
Bridget's come up trumps. Hello, DB. You're my last hope. <laughs> Have you got anything earlier than the 19th century here? <laughs> Actually, it looks as though I do. Two pieces of pottery look very medieval. Great. Let's have a look. What do you think? They are, yes. That's um, a storage jar or a cooking pot. OK. And it's 12th to 14th century. And it's, it's good because on the big dig yeah. at this site, a few sherds were found in the test pit. This is the biggest piece. It's from the same sort of thing, a cooking okay. pot or jar. Yeah, you can see the turning marks, can't you? Yeah, and it's, again, 12th to 14th century. The plot thickens. It would be nice to believe this 12th century cooking vessel was used by workers at a bloomery furnace in Rob's garden. The only problem is we still haven't found any more medieval slag or other iron making remains to back up the theory. And some members of the team are starting to think our best chance of finding a medieval furnace may not be at Furnace Cottage at all, but a mile down the road at East Wall. This is East Wall, where we've been told there should be evidence of more iron working. And ever since we've been here, you've been skipping around like a lamb, haven't you? Yeah, I, I think this is an ideal settlement site. If we're looking for places where there might have been furnaces and so on, and workers to work them, this is the sort of place I would come. You know, it's a nice flat platform above the river with good steep slopes on each side and woods and so on. So where do we put the trenches? Well, it's not as simple as that. Stuart's looked at the earthworks, which I, you know, I was prepared to put money on there were cottages and so on. He doesn't like them. He thinks there might be a few gardens here and he thinks a lot of the rest of it's natural. And the document that led us to the place in the first place, I think, needs re-examining. We're not quite sure we're on the right place for it here. But you've done the geophys here, haven't you? And you think it's great? Well, I think it's a fantastic site. I mean, the farm has told us about all the slag is found in this field. And, I mean, we've got some superb results. I mean, look at this. There's anomalies all over. They could all be to do with metalworking. But I, I certainly want to dig. But you want trenches? Yeah, definitely. I just don't really feel we should be digging here at all. I don't understand why we suddenly want to dilute our effort. We've got more than enough to keep us occupied at Old Furnace. I, I think we should do one job properly. <laughs> Beginning of day two, and last night no one could make up their minds what we should do on this site where an ancient document said there was once a medieval furnace. Should we put some trenches in? Should we just survey it? Or should we leave it alone because there's such interesting archaeology on the other site? Well, we agreed that we would decide this morning, and in true Time Team fashion, no one's taken a blind bit of notice of that and they've started digging already. What happened to this meeting to decide what we were going to do here? We've had it. Yeah. You've had it? We've had it, yeah. yeah. Uh, is Carenza here? No, no, she's, she's, here she's on the other train. No, we've decided. Mm. We've, we've, Why have we've you decided? decided? Well, look, one of the things we were waiting for is for a chance to reprocess the results. We've got some fantastic responses if we look at the plan. Looks like a ditched enclosure coming round uh, and these strong anomalies here and what we decided to do is put a small test pit in, just to have a look. And Kerry started digging that. What's it like, Kerry? It's rock hard all over. Why? It's solid slag. It is slag? It yeah. is. Yeah. So what we want to do is extend the trench to see if we've actually got some sort of structure in there. This is too good to ignore. OK. <laughs> I'm sure there won't be any rows about this. Fine. Oh, I, I bet there will. I bet there will. So, more slag for our diggers to hack through. But underneath it may lie our best chance of finding an early bloomery furnace. In fact, it might be our only chance. At Furnace Cottage, we've uncovered some medieval pottery, but still no sign of iron working before the Elizabethan period. And all that seems to be coming out of Phil's trench is yet more blast furnace slag. This is the sort of stuff we've been finding. That's in there. There was just a big layer. So this is material that's actually come out of the bottom of a furnace. It's just the debris that was thrown away. But nothing medieval. No, no, no. Well, you want medieval? Well, it well, well, I'll give we you did. medieval, or at least I think I can. Look at that. I'm no expert, but that's looking as though that could well be medieval to me. The beauty of it is it's stratified. That is as good an evidence for the dating of that slag heap as you're likely to get. But the slag heap's definitely... Blast furnace. The technology yeah, is blast yeah. furnace. Well, I mean, you look, look at it, so Jerry. So have you look, got any bits down now that look a bit more like that? <laughs> well, no, I don't know. It looks, it's and just that's slag. stuff near, near, in the corner. Hey? This sort of stuff. Well, it's all slag. I mean... <laughs> no, no, no. That's medieval. That's what we'd classify as medieval tap slag. So we have got what? it here. Hang on, hang on. You were saying you were pretty certain we didn't have any evidence from medieval bloomery and that this had come in as a bit of garden. Yeah, you can't, can't build a medieval bloomery argument on one piece of slag. But can you build a bloomy evidence? Yes. If, if, the, if that is consistent with the other material that's coming out of there, then that 
looks to me well, definitely I, mean, I, I haven't been examining every piece I've just been <laughs> shoveling out. Well, so, we need so, to examine a few. So, so the story has changed again. Yes. We have got yeah. evidence from medieval Bloomery. This is what we came back here hoping to investigate, and it looks like there really is mm. something to investigate, possibly. Are medieval Bloomery perhaps water-powered? Yes, and what we need to do, really, is I need to take some of this back to the lab and get it sectioned and cut up and have a look at it. As fast as you can. I will do. <laughs> <laughs> this is just the breakthrough we've been hoping for. It means the hunt's back on for a medieval furnace in Rob's garden. And if that wasn't enough, a mile down the road at East Wall Farm, we're hoping to find another one. But even if there was a Bloomery furnace here in the Middle Ages, there's no guarantee we'll find any surviving structures. So we're going to build our own reconstruction of a medieval-style Bloomery. Phil's taking a break from slag shifting to check up on progress. And now, Tim, I thought you were building a furnace. All you've got is a hole in the ground. No, we mustn't confuse these with, with later blast furnaces that are really big. Bloomeries are, are really quite small scale. We can still make quite a substantial piece of iron in it, but it's pretty small. And they're going to be made out of bricks. The superstructure would originally just have been solid clay. So we've got perhaps a month of drying of clay before this would take its own weight. So what we're doing is, to fit in with the timescale, we're putting a brick framework inside the wall of the furnace to support the clay so the thing hopefully can stand up uh, in time to be used. Well, That's if all it's as simple as that, let's go on and build it. <laughs> OK. <laughs> We want to smelt some iron here tomorrow, so our bloomery builders have their work cut out. By using bricks as well as clay, we're speeding up the construction process, but we're departing from the tried and tested medieval formula. We won't know until tomorrow whether it's been a good decision. Across the valley at Furnace Cottage, we've called a halt to work in Trench 4, which was investigating an earthwork platform across the stream from Rob's garden. We think this would have supported a bridge leading into the furnace complex. Another piece of our Elizabethan jigsaw slots into place. As we dig deeper into Rob's lawn, Bridget's finding more evidence of medieval iron making. Ah, uh, guess what? More slag. Good, good, good. <laughs> Look at this. In this pile, we've got the blast slag. Right. But we do have little bits of um, the bloomery slag. Mm -hmm. Look at this lovely piece. That, that's a superb piece of, of medieval bloomery slag where it's flowed out and the surface has cooled, really like sort of jam, and then the crust cools and then the rest freezes underneath. Carenza's opened a new trench to target a channel which might have carried water away from the water wheel and back to the stream. So now we have three trenches open in the garden. We think the sand and slag in Phil's trench are the remnants of the casting area where the molten iron was tapped from the furnace. Based on what we know from other excavated sites, if Phil's trench is on the edge of the casting area, then the heart of the complex, the furnace stack itself, must lie further up the slope here. We'd love to put in a trench to find it, but there's just one small problem. Furnace cottage itself. We can't ask Rob to demolish his family home, so our experts have come up with a plan B instead. So, if we didn't go all the way to the house, you're saying that we should start here somewhere yeah. and, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. come down to sort of here? Yeah. Yeah. I think you need to talk to Rob about it. It's his garden. I reckon he'll be relaxed about the path, but a bit worried about anything else. Have a word with him. Sounds like it's down to you, Tone, that. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Why do I always get this job? We've taken to the air to investigate what makes this such a suitable location for a blast furnace. There are three valleys all come together. You've got the main valley here. You've got this valley up this side coming where the road comes down. And you've got this one where this pack horse trail comes down. And valleys are, are vital to, to the process of, of smelting and blast furnaces. For the simple reason, you, you've got water down them and it's the, the proximity of water that's needed to drive the bellows, to, to fire the furnace. So you need a siting where you can harness the natural resources of water. You need to be able to create dams to store water. 
you need to be able to manage it through a network of, of leads and channels so that it arrives at the water wheel at the right speed and, and constantly. Yeah, from the air you can see much more clearly how strategically placed our furnace is. It, yeah, indeed. At Furnace Cottage, we're still piecing together the layout of the Elizabethan furnace. We know from the account books that it was turning out huge quantities of iron each year, so it must have been a pretty impressive structure. We think the central furnace stack must have stood close to the cottage itself. Rob's given the thumbs up to our trench extension, which is our best chance of finding it. And it's all hands to the pump at our experimental archaeology site, where we're building a medieval-style bloomery. The furnace is really beginning to take shape now, which is just as well. The building needs to be finished today if the clay is to have any chance of drying out, so we can smelt some iron here tomorrow. It's the sort of structure we're hoping to find at East Wall Farm, where it's time for someone to eat some humble pie. Yesterday, Stuart said he couldn't see any evidence in the landscape for a furnace here, but John's Jafiz told a different story. All I can tell you is that John called me on the intercoms and asked me to bring you over, oh, yeah. and there was the sound of triumph in his voice. He's looking smug, isn't he? <laughs> what you got for us, John? Well, I think I'd just like to say there's two ways of doing archaeological survey. One is to use your common sense and what you can see with your eyes. The other is to do it scientifically. Well, if we'd have done this with common sense, I think somebody said there was nothing here. <laughs> but actually, if we look at the scientific results, we've got something fantastic, an in-situ furnace. John, that was the longest gloat I've ever heard. <laughs> Jerry, is it really a furnace? Yes, it is, definitely. Uh, what, can you, what can you see that makes you so certain? Right, what we've got over there is very heavily slag-attacked clay lining. We've then got burnt red lining, which slowly changes to unburnt clay. So what I predict we've got is the furnace just under here, which will be about 40 centimetres in diameter internal. And then what we'll have coming down here is a tapping channel where they ran the slag out into the pit down here. Is it possible to date it at all? At this stage, it's difficult because essentially this technology is in Britain from the late Iron Age onwards. But one of the things is that this slag is quite distinctive. It's very like a sort of a crunchy bar <laughs> texture. And I've seen that in, in other research areas, very much related to the medieval period. Yeah, I think I can help you out with the data. We've got uh, two pieces of uh, 13th, 14th century whiteware, and they've actually got a little bit of slag on them. Well, that seems pretty conclusive. Yeah, it's got yeah. the slag on it. Fantastic. So, how are you feeling about this? Impressive. M Very impressive. Mr. No, there's no furnace here. <laughs> no, no, I never said that. <laughs> uh, what, when I looked at this landscape here, w were there any earthworks here which were indicative of bloomery sites? Mm. And the answer to that is no, not on the surface. That's one of the great problems of looking for these yeah. sites, because archaeologically, normal field walking, they're invisible. Mm. You have to use common sense and looking for slag and finding slag and then applying geophysics, because that's the only way you can understand these sites. So finally, after nearly two days of backbreaking work, we get our first glimpse of a furnace structure. It's possible the iron makers here would have harnessed the power of a nearby stream to drive the bellows of their bloomery. If they did, we might reveal something really special here tomorrow. And we'll also find out if our replica furnace is up to the job of smelting some iron. Oh, that looks so good. You're really proud of this, aren't you? Yeah, you bet. So you should be. Yeah, this is actually the clay from the farm. It's just dug out at the back of the barn on the farm, and it's, uh, it's marvellous stuff. Can I feel it? But, yeah. It's very damp, isn't it? Yes. So that's our next job. We've got to fire the kiln now, just to give it a bit of a drying out, and uh, hopefully it'll be ready for the morning. It's the end of a hectic day, too. We still have our work cut out to unravel the story of Furnace Cottage, but it's already becoming clear how much the garden and the surrounding countryside was shaped by the industrial activity that took place here over the centuries. You see how deep that pit is down there? We are still at the bottom there, going through the medieval slag heap. The whole of this ground surface we're standing on is completely artificial. The surface those cottages are built on, that the trees are all growing on, the whole of this bit of the valley 
wasn't here in the Middle Ages. It was all right down there. There's a completely different landscape then, and that is all because of the iron working here. What about the extension to this trench? Well, of course, this is our great white hope at the moment. Everything is telling us that both the medieval bloomery and the Elizabethan blast furnace are up the slope here because all the slag, the waste product, is being thrown away down the slope. So hopefully this trench should have within it either of those furnaces or even possibly both of them. So it's the end of day two. Yesterday we were hoping for a glimpse of a furnace and we got one, except that it wasn't here, it was about a mile away at the other site. Tomorrow we think there are two furnaces here, but in order to find them we've got to get down not just to here, not just to here, but right down to here. Beginning of day three in our quest to piece together the story of centuries of iron making in this square mile of the Staffordshire countryside. And with two sites up and running, there's plenty to keep our archaeologists busy. At Furnace Cottage, we're piecing together the layout of an Elizabethan furnace complex. In the garden, we're getting closer to the heart of the operation, the furnace stack itself. We're also discovering how the 16th century iron makers left their mark on the surrounding countryside. The streams in the valley here would have been channeled into the site to drive a water wheel which powered the furnace bellows. Stuart's investigating how it was done. The discoveries we've been making have inspired the owner of Furnace Cottage, artist Rob Chapman, to take up his brushes. They're, um based on the names taken from the, the accounts for the furnace. It's, uh, it's really good that we've got um, names for all the people who worked here. I wanted to put faces to those names. So these are real people, part of our story. Humphrey Beddle, William Beardmore. I mean, Humphrey Beddle was like the hired gun who was brought in to set up the foundry. He was the expert who could make it work. He was the first founder here. Yeah. But this guy's really nice as well because this is William Beardmore. He's, he's not a hired gun, he's a local lad. He's working here as a labourer. Rob's next-door neighbour, Dorothy, has a special reason for taking an interest in this chap. He's one of her ancestors. How are you related to him? Well, this is my family tree. Yep. And he's here. So you're the great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-granddaughter of this bloke. That's right. <laughs> Do we have much evidence of many other people? We have masses of names every week. There are detailed accounts kept of exactly every single person who's paid. Here you see William Beardmore here is being paid for stoneworking, for labouring. So that's... Oh, how much did he get? Not a lot, I bet. About nine pence a day. <laughs> <laughs> but he looks is, happy enough on smiling. it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm heading for our second site at East Wall where yesterday we began to uncover the remains of a medieval bloomery furnace. We thought it might have been damaged by ploughing, but we needn't have worried. It's beginning to look like something very special indeed. Matt, that is a lovely piece of archaeology, isn't it? It's great, isn't it? Can I have a closer look? Yeah, yeah, take a step and get down there. Thanks. So what have you done since we were here yesterday afternoon? Well, we extended the trench out this way to get the rest of the, rest of the furnace, and as you can see, you've got an absolutely solid base of the furnace here. Um, it's packed around with these stones here, so the, the wall of the furnace originally would have come out to about here. Out that side, we've got the slag tapping channel, so all this slag byproduct has been scraped out, filling this enormous hole over here. Jerry, this looks to me like the crater of an enormous pimple. <laughs> what can you tell us about what was going on here? Right, what we're looking at, Tony, you've got to remember, is we're only really looking at the, really the bottom portion of the furnace. Originally, it would have st stood perhaps two metres higher than us, so we're really looking at a truncated bottom bit but it's really the heart of the furnace where the really high temperatures we're operating at. And we've got this thick lining which insulates the furnace. And the type of slag that's coming out is this very, which I call crunchy bar or aero-like slag. And what it tells us is that the slag coming out is very, very hot because the, the bubbles in it are actually trapped air that get trapped while the slag is very hot. And as it cools, the air's released and forms these bubbles. So one thing that I'm thinking that comes out of this is in order to get those temperatures, we've got to have water power. If we found that this furnace was water powered, would that be particularly significant? It, it would be very, very significant, really important. There are very few examples of known water powered sites and, as my opinion, none have been satisfactorily excavated. So it'd be the first. This site's getting better and better. 
Water-powered bloomeries are the crucial missing link between the standard bloomeries and blast furnaces. They were developed to meet the growing appetite for iron used in farming implements, household tools and weaponry. To find one here would be a major discovery. But we'll only know for sure once Jerry's taken a closer look at the material coming out of the trenches. The smelt's beginning at our own reconstruction of a bloomery. The recipe for iron is pretty simple. Iron ore and charcoal are introduced at the top of the furnace. As the temperature inside rises, they should react with the clay lining of the furnace itself to produce the bloom. At least that's the theory. The only problem is the clay hasn't dried out as quickly as we'd hoped. Only time will tell if these running repairs will be enough to salvage our experiment. In the garden at Furnace Cottage, Phil's finally reached the natural geology in Trench 1. We'd been working on the assumption that the steep bank of sand in here was the remains of the casting area for the Elizabethan furnace. We've got all this sandy material with lots and lots of charcoal, and then over the top of that, we've got a series of, of slag deposits. So the, this is lying on this sandy stuff, is that right? Yeah, this is, this is, this is right somewhere near the bottom. Now it's sort of dawning on me, that sand cannot possibly stand up on its own oh, yeah. at an angle like that. It could not possibly stand up on its own. So I think that that sand has been there and then they've chopped through it and then all this slag has, has been dumped over mm. the top before it's had time for that sand mm. to fall away. So this sandy material could be a lot earlier than this slag. OK, Phil, like, what I was just wondering is whether this actually, this burnt material is actually the remains of the medieval bloomery that's then subsequently being cut away and fashioned away and then the, the Elizabethan blast furnace debris and casting debris coming right on top of it. Phil's trench captures the moment 400 years ago when the Elizabethan ironmakers ripped through the remains of the medieval bloomery, digging a pit to dump the slag waste from the blast furnace. It means we can now pinpoint the location of the medieval bloomery here and the Elizabethan blast furnace further up the hill here. Just as we hoped, Rob's compact garden does contain two furnaces after all. We're approaching the moment of truth at our medieval-style bloomery. If the smelt's progressing according to plan, it should be possible to see some liquid slag running out at the base of the furnace. The early signs are encouraging. We've got some that you see it dripping at the back. Ah yes! You can see it dripping and flowing. Yeah, I can. We need to stop. Need to, yeah, we need to free that a bit more. It needs a little bit more. But it will here. come, you reckon? It'll now. Come, I think. Yeah. But then the alarm bells start to ring. Start to flow. It's nothing happening. Should it have gone by now? I would have hoped it would have done, but. It's one of the unknowns. We've got a different clay that we're using here, so we really don't know what its properties will be. There ought to be more slag than this. Perhaps we're rushing things too much, so the furnace is sealed again to allow a little more time for the iron bloom to form. It's time to put together the final pieces of the Furnace Cottage jigsaw. Based on a geophys survey of this field, we put in a small test pit in this area. In it, we found locally sourced iron ore and this Elizabethan pottery, the first anywhere on the site. That's just what I hope we'd find up here. It looks like we've got the storeroom for the Elizabethan blast furnace. It's another site to add to Stuart's map of industrial activity in this valley. Clearly in the, the medieval period, the bloomery is just sitting alongside a stream in this river valley yeah. here. Nothing particularly unusual about that, I don't think. But by the Elizabethan period, it all ch changes into a, into a managed valley yeah. to, to, yeah. to service the, the industry here. They'd put a dam across the valley and create a pond behind, another one up there, all harnessing these streams around yeah. here. Yeah. So the whole thing fits together yeah. as a whole piece of managed landscape. Yeah. A lot like the other, other furnace sites we see elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. 
Now, the, the sort of debate here is, where is the wheel? Yes. Is it on this upper channel? Or on the other one. Or on that one yeah. there? I think that question is, is unresolved yeah. at the moment. I, I suspect... I actually it's... don't think it matters as long as you've got two channels, because one of them is, is running the power, and the other is the bypassing case yeah, of flood. Yeah, that's right, yeah. The yeah. other interesting thing I've found here is that there has to be charcoal storage here. That's yeah. often the biggest building on yeah. the site in, yeah. in many cases. And I think under here, under Furnace Farm, is the charcoal right. barn area. Right. Right. And it's evolved into, a, into a, a farm. The 16th century blast furnace at Oakamore was the centrepiece of a major industrial complex which left its mark on the woodlands and waterways for miles around. Night and day for nearly 15 years, it drew on the rich natural resources in the valley to meet the huge Elizabethan demand for iron, used in everything from cannons to cutlery. And at the heart of the operation was the furnace stack itself, which once stood precisely where Furnace Cottage is today. It looks as though the furnace Rob wanted us to find was even closer to home than he realised. Things aren't looking good at our experimental bloomery. The slag which should have gathered at the bottom of the furnace has attached itself to the lining instead, and it's a major job to prise it off. So what is that, then? That's slag. That is slag, is it? That's, That's what slag. should have poured off, then. Yeah. So now we've dealt with the slag, it's time to play Hunt the Bloom. Oh, is it? So this should be our bloom. Well... <laughs> it doesn't look much different from the slag, but after a little closer examination, it gets the thumbs up from our expert. This spiky texture around here that right. looks like iron. Right. So I think we've got we've got bloom on this side. This bit is bloom, I think. Right. And there. It's probably not the world's greatest one or the world's largest one, but it's a bit of iron. Any self-respecting medieval iron worker would have thrown this disappointing specimen back into the furnace and started again. We don't have time for a second smelt, but we're determined to produce some pure iron. So the blooms reheated in the furnace, then hammered to remove the excess slag. And this is what we're left with. Not much to show for two days hard work, but pure iron nonetheless. In the incident room, Jerry, our metals expert, has been taking a closer look at the slag samples from the medieval furnaces at our two sites. They could help us answer one of the major questions of this dig. Were either of the furnaces using water power? This is the sample from old furnace. This is the bloomery slag. And what we see on the screen is the microstructure, the crystalline structure of the slags. Right. Now, what's important is this white Christmas tree material because yeah. this shows that this process that was used at Old Furnace is not particularly efficient because that is iron oxide that could have been reduced to metal. Right, so the more white sort of tree-like patterns mm -hmm. you've got, the, the less efficient the process. That's right, that's right. right. okay. Right. And that's pretty typical yeah. of a number of bloomery furnace slags that you'd see virtually across the country. Yeah. So, as we suspected, no evidence of water power at Furnace Cottage. But how about East Wall? Oh, no, it doesn't have the little Christmas tree structure. That's no, right. No dendritic yeah. stuff at all. It is there, but it's incredibly, incredibly yeah. fine. Right. What this means is that the process at East Wall was tremendously efficient. It's right. got mm. really strong reducing conditions, which means that they are being most efficient. They're reducing every available piece of iron oxide to metal. Now, right. put that in with the high-temperature, frothy slags. Yeah. It means that we are seeing a step change in technology between old furnace bloomery site and east wall bloomery site. And because of the nature of that technology, it is moving towards, as it were, blast furnace technology. Right. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, the step change is water power. It's exactly the news we've been hoping for. The furnace we've uncovered at East Wall Farm was a high-tech piece of Middle Ages technology. It's incredibly rare and remarkably well-preserved. How have you got on then, Matt, since this morning? Well, we've emptied out the kiln now. Can we come in your trench? Yeah, yeah, get down there. Um, and you see it's a little deeper than we first thought. Oh, we, nice. we don't have that huge layers of charcoal, which we, we may get inside furnaces like this. But what we did have at the bottom, though, was a layer of, uh, of this slag. A lot of slag left over in it. 
Oh, crack, it's very light. Very though, light isn't indeed, it? isn't it? Oh, it is. They must have got rid of most of the metal out of that. Yeah, thing. yeah. Right. There were no, no actual bloom or bloom remains. No, in, presumably, in the last use, they, they took out the bloom right. and, and, and used it. Yeah. Yeah. Ian, can you see where the bellows might have come into this? Yeah, I think we've got just the bottom of it here. And that curving aperture there, that's where the bellows came in. And that lump of slag there, that's where, the, where it went out underneath through there. In the 12th century, there would probably have been several furnaces at East Wall. But these were no ordinary bloomeries. By harnessing the nearby water source to produce iron of the highest quality, the iron workers here were making a crucial step towards the later blast furnace method of iron production. The bloomery at Furnace Cottage was a much humbler affair. The burnt sand in Phil's trench is all that remains of it. The rest is long gone, obliterated by the Elizabethan ironworks built here in the last years of the 16th century. It's just gone seven o'clock, nearly everyone's gone home. But just over 10 minutes ago, one of the diggers found this. And Debbie says it's definitely Anglo-Saxon. Nice find. Excellent. We've got to think that if this was a good enough place to smelt in the Elizabethan period, the medieval period, then it was probably a good enough place to smelt in the Saxon period. You said three weeks ago on the big dig that you thought this place could be of major archaeological importance. Are you pleased? I am, yes. I mean, was it luck or judgment? But I can't resist saying, I told you so. Fair enough, Carenza. <laughs> but there is a downside, isn't there? You've spent the last three days drawing all those beautiful medieval figures, and now, Rob, you're going to have to start drawing Saxon ones. Thanks so much. Over the last three days, we've shifted more slag than I ever thought possible. But all this work's given us an insight into the hive of activity that once took place here. Generations of people worked in the mines and forests, feeding furnaces like the ones here in Rob's garden. And I feel that we've got closer to those people and the amazing technological advances that their skills and energy made possible. Not only that, but we've proved that that activity took place for nearly a thousand years. Not bad for a story that started with just one small test pit.